Hello everybody, it's Storytime with Dutch Mantel. It's not an episode with a number, it is a special, then we're going to be talking about CM Punk for the entire hour, apart from uh, we found out two minutes ago that the Queen had died, so long live the Queen. Absolutely. I was just telling, uh, right before we went on air today, I was telling James that uh, the Queen, I'm an American of course, and the Queen is the only Queen I've ever known. So, and I had a lot of respect for her. I had a lot of respect for the royalty uh, in in England because I love that stuff. I like all the pomp and circumstance, and I just like that stuff. Now, a lot of people say, well, we don't need the queen. We don't need that. And I don't think the queen has any power per se, right? Well, but she is a, she is... Uh, she is a figurehead, but ultimately she does actually have power to dissolve Parliament. She has a lot of power that actually the Queen just never wields. I think the last time the, the Queen wielded her considerable power was something in like dissolving the Parliament in Australia because they couldn't work out uh, something or other. I'm, I'm, I'm not a royalist, but uh, very occasionally she will, uh, she will wield that power when she needed to. Well, my condolences to you and all the subjects the british subjects and the empire you know if you really read history england had quite a bit of influence on world history mm -hmm. to be actually not that big in size they had a lot of influence in the world and of course it spread the language and then that's where the united states came from because when the the Britons come here and tried to lock us down. We said, and we have muskets and we'll shoot you. So, but, and we got free of that. So, but anyway, condolences to, to Queen Elizabeth and the family, except for, I got to get this in Megan Markle. I don't much like she's American, but I don't, I don't think she's very well liked in, in, in the UK reviled. And, and she's not very well liked in the U.S. So, see, that's the beauty of this podcast, because not only do we talk wrestling, we talk a little bit of history. So if you listen, and this is the same stuff that wrestlers would talk about going up and down the road. It wasn't wrestling. You know, if you had a three-hour trip, it wasn't wrestling we talked about. We were talking about world affairs and, you know, and politics, and we'd cuss each other out, and we'd stop. We'd want to fight. And but, and sometimes that did come off. Sometimes we did have some fights on the side of the road, not about wrestling, but about what we were talking about because one guy called the other a stupid bastard or whatever, but he hurt one of their feelings, and, and we would get it out that way, which, which is kind of the essence of, of what we're talking about today, so continue. Well, uh, to far less important stuff, but actually before we get to the far less important CM Punk stuff, uh, we are going to go to far more important plugs. Owen Hart, King of Pranks. Oh, hang on, you've got a doll. Or a figure. I, I do have a doll. And there we go. Handsome looking bastard. All right, so go ahead. They have, they have captured the light as well. Um, the Rock, the People's Champion on Amazon, and of course, The World According to Dutch, and if I can get it the right way around, Tales from a Dirt Road, both on Amazon as well. And if you're on iTunes, five stars if you can give it us, and uh, yes, Dutch. Well, I was just saying, I'm, I'm in the process now of writing my third book. I said they would be three when I started, and I wrote these two within a year of each other. And that was about 2011, 2010, 2011. And I always said that there would be another book. And in this book, uh, I will cover my WWE days and I will, I will cover, and even I would even cover me doing the podcasting. I will cover a lot of things that I didn't before. And it should be a good book because sometimes I even find myself now looking at the book laying on the shelf or the, my desk or something. And I'll pick it up and thumb through it and I'll just start reading. And before I know it, I've, I've, I've read the whole chapter. And the thing about these chapters are they're not in a linear sense. It doesn't start in 2000, say in 1970 and go all the way through. 
it might, I may tell a story from 1986. Then the next one I tell is from, you know, 2004. So, which I think makes for, uh, actually makes for good reading. And you can, you can, you can read a chapter and put it down. If you, if you can put it down, Stone Cold Steve Austin told me he got the book, started reading and read the whole book. Uh, he, he couldn't put it down. He actually cursed me. He said, you son of a bitch. I started the book and couldn't put it down. Now I'm sleepier in hell. But I, he said, I just couldn't put the book down. And then Cornette told me, he says, you know, as when I'm reading the book, I'm not reading words. I'm hearing your voice. So an audio book. Well, it's not an audio book. No, but, but I mean, it should be. Yeah, but Cornette's to him, it was. And it should be an audio book. Well, there you go for book three, out for Christmas, hopefully, audio book, maybe. And I just need a name for it. I think I, you, do you have an idea for it? A, a title? Uh, uh, no. Well, it was Tales <laughs> from a Dirt Road, so it should be Tales or Musings. I was, I was musing some 50 years on a road. But wrestling has to be in the title somewhere. If not, you know, wrestling fans, I don't think they get it. I Down mean, you and dirty lead with Dutch. Some, so, someone kept, uh, I'm trying to think of other ones now. Pass the Dutchy on the left-hand side. Um, I'm trying to think of any other Dutch, Dutch sort of things. Mm. Going Dutch. Yeah, well, tell the fans to think about, hey, fans, <laughs> think about the title of my next book and get, get back to me at Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com and also those books i do uh, i do personally autograph them but you have to go through me and it's dirty dutch man tail two l's at gmail and write me and i'll tell you how to get it and dutch was very polite there um he didn't want to say that my ideas were shit for his uh, book title but we'll move <laughs> i know no, I, I did shit. I, I, I did like well one thing i always heard in wrestling the worst the worst angle or the idea, the worst idea is the one that's not pitched. I don't give a damn how stupid it is. Pitch it. So you know go. who told me that? You know who told me that? Cornet? No. Vince Russo. Oh, really? <laughs> now, if, if Cornet hears this and his name is mentioned like positively in the same sentence with his name, He'll go nuts because, you know, and I had, I had a chapter uh, in my last book, Tales from a Dirt Road, and it is about the feud between Cornette and Russo. And it was a real true to life feud. And I do think if Cornette could have got, got away from, I don't know, I wouldn't say killing him, but I think if he could have got away from, like, he could have got free from shooting him. I think he may have shot Vince. So, yeah, and he just he, easy. he hates he hates Vince, which I think is a little bit extreme. I mean, why waste your energy on hurting people? Just don't have nothing to do with them. I did tell him one day. I told Jimmy, and I, I think I may have told Vince too. I said, "Listen, guys, why?" And I this is when uh, Vince had moved back to Indiana. I said, "Why don't you guys pick a spot?" halfway between Louisville, Kentucky, and wherever the town was in Indiana, on the interstate or wherever, pull over on the side of the road where there's a cornfield at a mile marker, and why don't you guys meet there at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday, get out of the car, walk over into the field, into the corn or whatever you, you got, and just, just bang it out. And whoever wins, wins, and whoever loses, loses, and then let that be the end of it. Don't keep bringing us all back in on top of it. That leads us to quite, actually quite perfectly to the uh, CM Punk I situation. That. Yeah, no. So yeah, I, I, I did it on purpose. Absolutely. I, I wanted to see if you could follow the lead here. <laughs> what a segue it was. And uh, <laughs> we are going to, uh, we're actually going to probably go for the beginning and got a ton of questions from people i think about 200 people sending questions or thereabout which is quite amazing but we're going to talk uh briefly or fairly briefly pre aew cm punk you were with 
CM Punk in the company 2013 to very early 2014 before he left. Uh, first time you met CM Punk, was it WWE? No, it was TNA about 2001 or maybe 2001, 2002. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, who is, uh, I remember we were in the afternoon, we were, we were going for lunch and they happened to be a little, we was at the national fairgrounds, which sits a little bit on a hill, a little bit, but you can walk down this little street and there's a little cafe down there, restaurant, not a restaurant. Uh, it had to be a cafe. It was an old building and they had turned into like a little bit of an eating place. And it was called the Redneck Saloon or something. And the food was okay, but it was just, and they would cater their, they would, you know, they catered the food for the wrestlers. So CM Punk went down there, and I cannot remember this guy's name, but he was related to the Hearts. Teddy Hart. Te okay, Teddy Hart. They went down there, and I don't know what it was about, but, you know, wrestlers are the biggest gossipers in the world. But what the hell? So by the time we got back up the hill, what I called it, everybody knew that Teddy Hart and CM Punk had had a fight. And apparently CM Punk, I didn't see it, but apparently Punk didn't win it. I think everybody gave it on points to, to, to Teddy Hart. But that was the end of it. It's, it ended right there. And, but this is not the case we're going to talk about today. So continue your little, your little segue. Well, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, absolutely not. Uh, w, no, you answered the question, in fact. I thought the first time you would have met him was in WWE. But um, I suppose in the WWE days when he was getting towards main event, or was main event at the time, um, yeah, he was, was he always, as we hear as fans, somewhat of a disruptive and difficult character? Well, let me put it like this. When I knew Punk, and he had already gone through his Ring of Honor stuff, and he, I guess he became fairly pro proficient at that, but somehow he got the, he got the news, or WWE got news of this guy, CM Punk, but he was always aloof. You like that word? Mm-hmm aloof because I don't think he had a lot of like he had some guys around him, but, and yeah, he was a little bit of a disruptor, I think. And I've told this story before I was in Cleveland, I think, or one of those. And I wanted to talk to Vince about an idea I had. So they kept telling me, and I've told this before here, well, you can't go in. Vince is busy. I said, hey, it'd be free in a little bit. And he was in there with CM Punk. And this went on and on and on. Even through the show, Vince did not go up and go to gorilla position because he was still in talks, I guess, or he was still in discussion with CM Punk. And I think this was 2013, was it? Uh, I think it was early 2014, but January 2014. around there. Well, he was pissed off because he didn't get the main event slot at WrestleMania. He thought he deserved the slot. And I don't think money had anything to do with it, to tell you the truth. I think it was the prestige of headlining a WrestleMania card. But, and I think he quit that day and he left and he didn't return. What was the uh, locker room opinion when obviously it was big news when I think it was WWE and Dr. Chris Amon, or Aman, however you pronounce it, sued Sam Punk for libel after the comments he made about possible malpractice on Colt Cabana's podcast? That was after I'd already departed. 
That was 2015, I think. I think it was later 2014, so you may have still been with the company or was on the well, cusp. Well, I was still with the company in 2016, but on air, on camera, I finished up in about 2014 because I, I had knee surgery. Then I broke my leg. Then I actually came back too soon. Uh, that's why I was in the cart. Uh, but what was the question? What was the... Uh, well, it was going to be a uh, locker room opinion whether they sided with WWE or CM Punk on this malpractice claim that he brought. I don't know what the locker room opinion on it was. But but I think I think everybody thought it was like trivial except Punk. If Punk did have an infection and they didn't find it, they would be in malpractice, I would think. And, but did he get any uh, second or third opinions? I imagine he would have done to believe it was a staph infection. Was it like at the base of his spine or something like that? I think. No, it was. I think it was on the in the middle of the back, but low. Yeah. Like not down on the buttocks, but and there was a swelling there. I've seen. I. It, I've seen it. He showed it to me, I think, one day. So, but if that would cause him any serious harm later on, yeah, a lawsuit may have been required to to get him to notice it. He didn't win it, or he did win it. I, th I think it was almost like a stalemate in the sense. I don't. I think it was just a, the only winners really with the lawyers. Okay, maybe so. Mm. We will move on then. Uh, I'll do the abridged version. I'm sure everybody who's watching knows the uh, ins and outs of the interviews and the first interview, uh, May 25th, 2022, CM Punk and Hangman Page face off verbally. And Hangman Page goes off piece somewhat with his comments by saying after to CM Punk, after all these years, I don't think you get it because it's not just about what happens in this ring. It's what happens when that led, uh, red light turns off. What happens when you go back through the curtain? Those small, quiet moments when you think no one's watching. You talk a big game about workers' rights. Well, you've shown the exact opposite since you've got here. And reportedly, this was at least partly in reference to the belief that Colt Cabana had been forced into re-signing with Tony Khan under a Ring of Honor contract, thereby removing him from AEW and the Dark Order faction. Do you think do you think maybe CM Punk had a hand in it? Do you think Tony Khan saw the lay of the land and thought best to move him? Well, if Tony Khan saw the lay of the land, that would be the first time he noticed there was land even there. <laughs> because to me, he's almost, you know, I use the term aloof. He's aloof to what's going on in his actual company. Now, I got a lot of, and I respect, Tony Khan, but there's no saying in wrestling, you can't be friends with the talent. You just can't be because you have direct influence over their career and their money. So you can't be friends with them. And I think that's what he's tried to do. He's tried to fit in. He wants to be one of the boys, which is, that's, that's not a good moniker anyway be one of the boys i mean you just you, you could be if they're a bunch of assholes you could just be one of the assholes i guess but he wanted to be friends to them and uh but it's it's not working out now let's get a little deeper into this the i, I if if punk did have something to do with with uh Coke Coke Cabana. Cabana going to to ring of honor I don't give a crap about that. I really don't. I mean, that's between them. But I don't put it past Punk just to tell him that you shouldn't have him here. And maybe by this time, Tony Khan had heard of the beef. I'm sure he had to hear about it. Between CM Punk and Cabana and all the legal issues going on. So uh, I, I can't say he didn't do it. But if he did which is about a 50-50 proposition, I, I don't even care about that. So, But that puts Tony Khan in a tough situation. Now, you saw, you saw the scrum. Uh, yes. What they call the, yes. the scrum. And for all of you Americans out there who've never heard of the word scrum, which sounds kind of nasty to me, to tell you the truth, 
but it's a British term, has to be, because I've never heard of any anything described as a scrum before in English or American English. So it had to be an English term. But here you got right after the pay-per-view, you got Tony Khan sitting out there doing the whole, it's a press conference, doing the whole press conference. And did you notice that when he was sitting with Punk, he was literally knocking some people head on, and Tony was sitting there nodding his head like, yeah, well. And he, he, he made one comment that was interesting to me. He said, I'm trying to run a business. Well, I didn't know he was in charge of it. I thought Tony Khan was in charge of running the business. So running the business means that he is financially uh, de uh, dependent on how well the, the company does. But I've never heard that. He's not an owner, is he? Nope. No percentage points in the business as far as I know. Well, and he said that, but Tony didn't say no or didn't shake his – he's agreeing with everything Punk said. He was um, – apologies for interrupting. He even apologized to CM Punk for some decision about not giving an answer to some journalist a few weeks earlier, and he was, he was deferential to Punk. And it's like, dude, yeah, you're the boss. Yeah. I mean, you know – you know what I mean? I've never seen anyone act so unboss like but, of a multi million dollar company. But, but Punk didn't treat him like a boss. He 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 treated him like, hey, he was just another guy. Like I can talk however I want, say whatever I want. And I think it was a very unflattering look for Tony Khan to sit out there and like just nod his head. Mm -hmm. That Tony has some big eyes, doesn't he? Oh, <laughs> look at those eyes sometimes. And he's looking around and I'm thinking, wait a minute. Nobody looks that way normally. I mean, and I'm beginning to think maybe he may have had a little chemical imbalance <laughs> somewhere along. And because he's looking around the room like this and he doesn't blink. So I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's what we used to say in the car, the wrestlers. I'm not saying but I'm saying, <laughs> so, so you say something and then disconnect yourself mm. from the very statement you just made. He was very wide-eyed uh, and um, <laughs> almost doe-eyed, like deer and in bushy headlights. Tail. Well, and bushy-tailed. Well, he's, well, he's bushy-haired, so that's the same <laughs> thing, just a different end. Uh, Punk also apparently had, uh, this is according to your uh, old friend Dave Meltzer, uh, heat in the locker room uh, since he got there pretty much because... He was, as a veteran, assuming a leadership role and trying to give some of the um, more flippy artists out there who do many, many spots some good advice about how to draw money long term. And nothing too specific, but he was trying to assume a, a leadership role and give advice, and a lot of the younger wrestlers uh, didn't take it. Well, if anybody doesn't take advice from a guy like CM Punk, whether you like him or not... I think he's just – that's disrespecting CM Punk and actually disrespecting learning the trade that you're trying to learn. Somebody asked me, have you ever been sought out for advice? Yes, I have. But later on when I went to WWE, did I willingly give advice without being asked? No, I didn't. Cause I didn't want somebody to say, what the hell do you know? Oh man, that is, you know, that's ancient history. So if they would come to me and say, can I get your opinion? And most of them who did that were very, very nice, but I never, did you get it? No, it flew off. I've got a fruit fly. Okay. Hanging right here. Sorry. But I, I never gave my opinion unsolicited. Now, if somebody asked for it, I'd give it. If you didn't ask for it, I wouldn't give it. So maybe Punk was trying trying to help some of these guys and they took offense at it. Or they could have taken it and then somebody later behind Punk's back said, Why are you listen to Punk? You know, hey, that's years ago. This is a new day. This is this. This is that. Well, I got news to them. It's all, backstage, it's all politics anyway. 
life is politics. So when you disrespect or talk behind a guy like CM Punk's back, that's, that's really bad for business because it creates a vibe in the dressing room. And some of those young guys actually think they, in, they invented uh, AEW. Well, it was Tony Khan's idea from the beginning. Have I ever told you I talked to, talk, I talked to Tony Khan when I was in WWE? I told you that, right? Yeah, you have. Yeah, you, you didn't even know who he was. He was just sat on one of those like uh, like wheeled cases sort of thing for the equipment, was he? Yeah, he was outside. We were in Jacksonville, and I was with WWE. This is about 2016, and he came up to me, and I will say that when he came up to me, as nice as he could be, as, I mean, he, with a lot of respect is what I'm saying. Because if there is one thing he, he respects, he does respect the wrestling business. And if he, uh, he does something wrong, it's not out of uh, just doing it because he, he thought it'd be bad. He did it because he thought it would be good. And the reason I remember him, he does have a little bit of an unusual look to him. But he told me, and I'm a football fan, he told me that his father owns the Jacksonville Jaguars. And we were in Jacksonville, so that explains his presence there. And he just wanted to talk wrestling. And I talked to him about 10 minutes. And then when I heard his name starting, starting to be tossed around about AEW, or after he'd already started it, now it explains why he was there. I do think he had more of a connection with WWE than what he's let everybody know up, up to this point. But he was in the back trying to figure out, well, if I start a company, what will I need? Then he got a look at how massive, how massive that operation is. Mm. So if, if you pull in, and just to give the people how, how big this looks, if you see WWE go to a town, They'll bring in nine or 10 tractor trailers with WWE all over it. And sometimes, you know, they used to put the big murals of the wrestlers on there, but it, it, it's, it, it's massive what they go from town to town with. And you see it, you can't, you can't, you can't help but be impressed. I mean, it takes this much equipment to broadcast a Raw or a SmackDown or a pay-per-view. It takes a lot. So a lot goes into those uh, broadcasts and pay-per-views and much bigger. And I was with the company, and it was much bigger than I even thought it would be. I'd pull in, and all you see is tractor trailers. So And you know what else you see? Uh, coaches, like passenger coaches. Mm -hmm. What are they called? Uh, Bus. It, well, it's a big bus, but it's a personal bus. Yeah. And then I found out, well, The Undertaker had one and Triple H had one. and I, I, But Vince never had one. Vince would travel by car, or as far as I know, he would travel by car from town to town. He never got on the bus. And I guess Stone Cold would have it. Uh, Big Show, Big Show had one, I think. Randy Orton had one. CM Punk. Had Randy one. Orton had one. Who 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 was the last one? Uh, Randy Orton, Big Show, CM Punk. I think they all had buses. They all had buses. Yeah. And I'm thinking, and you know what those buses cost to, to operate? So for an uh, entire year, you've got to talk about, six figures. Well, the buses are like a million dollars. I, I know they're million dollars now. I mean, but there's oh, they're so nice. I mean, I've, I've traveled on not the stars buses, but TNA used to rent a bus to go from Nashville to Orlando. You know, that's a hell of a long drive. You drive all night long and you get there, but it, it was comfortable, but I mean, but you can't put 10 guys on it. That's what they did. If you just got one guy on it or two guys, you may be okay. But, but that's what they travel with. All right, so let's go. Let's just get back to the arguing and the fighting here. Uh, well, before we do, CM Punk, Hangman Page, uh, 
let's just get the interview. CM Punk gets his own back in a promo, calls out Hangman Page. Hangman Page, it's not in the script. He doesn't turn up. It makes Adam look stupid. And so you're talking about uh, CM Punk is doing an interview live yep. in the ring, mm-hmm. calling out Hangman Page. Mm-hmm. Hangman Page was in the building or he wasn't in the building? I still haven't established that. I don't know if he was not in the building or if he was in catering, but either way, he didn't know anything about this, so he ends up looking... Well, if he was uh, in the building, he still could have answered it. Well, he could have, but that would been all. That would been a really screwed-up deal. Mm. <clears throat> But I think Punk called him out on purpose. And and Punk was giving him a receipt for that other interview he'd done talking about workers' rights. Mm-hmm. He went into business for himself, <clears throat> which was the wrong thing to do, too. But, and Hangman Page remembered it. And the thing is this, when somebody does something like that, let me tell you how that works They're like a bunch of kids a lot of times because when hangman page went into business for himself, all, all the people around punk says, why'd you let him do that? And now he gets to thinking, okay, yeah. Why did I let him do that? But he can always say, well, I'll let him do it because of, you know, the business and we didn't need to air it out there, which is true. So when he went out, and challenged Hangman Page, he was giving him a receipt back for what Page had done to him two or three weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. It's not missed amongst the people involved. They know what's going on. So that that pisses off Page, and now we're off and running. Uh, Well, uh, first question from a writer in a subscriber, Chip Bates. How does Dutch feel about allowing worked shoot promos and the risks? Oh, the risk heavily outweigh the shoot part of it, unless it's, unless it's controlled. Now you can see a few things where the people talk about, uh, what was the one that Shawn Michael said to Bret Hart? Sunny days. Having some sunny days, but everybody got that without going into detail. Everybody got it. Brett got it. Sean knew what he was pitching, but he didn't really go into detail. And it wasn't as open as this in AEW is or was. So I I think that if you're going to do a shoot promo, you got to have a guy in the back who's controlling these promos to regulate it. And Tony wasn't on top of it. Of course, they didn't tell Tony. I don't think they told Tony they were going to do it anyway. They just went and did it. Do you think it needs like an intermediary so both parties can say, I don't want this said, I don't want this said, and then agree before anything happens? This would have never happened under Vince. You know, I had a crazy thought the other day. I said, Vince doesn't have a job. (laughs) And maybe, maybe <laughs> he could call up Tony and hire himself on. But that would have never happened under Vince mm-hmm. because heads would have rolled that day. That as soon as it was said, Vince would have been up screaming, throwing, ripping papers up, cussing everybody out that he could see, even though they had nothing to do with it. But that would have never happened under Vince. So an intermediary would help, but only an intermediary could help only if they knew it was going on. This wasn't in any script anywhere. They just, they got mad at each other. That's what it was. And let me tell you how that madness goes backstage. You know, the guy's going up to punk. Why did not you let him say that? Okay. And in his head, it's rolling. I'll get him back. He does the hangman page where he knows he can't answer. That's his receipt back. That's when it starts. Now the little young bucks start on page. What the hell was he talking? You going to let him get by with that? Now they're challenging him. What are you going to do? And then, you know, they start talking. And then, of course, punk gets word of that. And punk starts talking. They get word of that. So it's a bunch of gossip going back and forth. 
And I don't know how Tony Khan missed it for three weeks or more. What are your agents back there doing? Are they informing Tony there's a problem? And also, remember, we heard through uh, sources, and I hate to quote these sources, but they said there was a lot of backstage discontent. And when this is allowed to flourish, especially with your young, young talent, you do a disservice to them and to the company by either continuing it or letting it thrive. And I hate to say this, or, or telling Tony. Now, telling Tony at this point would be called in the business stooging it off or being a stooge. But sometimes some things need to be stooged off for the benefit of everybody. And I hate this happened to him. I don't think Tony knows what to do. And we'll get to the rampage in just a minute. But I think, Tony, this took him by surprise. You got a question there I read. You sent it to me. Can you find it? The guy said that you said something a week ago. Oh, that's Tony, uh, Tony. I'm saving that for the end. I'm saving that okay. for the end. I've, that, well, that's save be save for that one. I gotta okay. blast my I gotta blast myself here. Okay, so <laughs> um, this was a question about um, this will be a very very quick uh, answer. Uh, Easty hindsight is twenty twenty as usual, but I always felt that they expanded the roster too quickly. I just wondered what Dutch thought, and I'm going to add to this: they've got three hours of first run television every week, uh, not including pay per views or specials or anything, and they have one hundred and thirty in ring wrestlers. So that's about forty three per hour. That's about double what they need. Mm -hmm. Double. Okay, Dynamite is an hour. Dynamite's two, Rampage one. Oh, so it's still three hours. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't need 130 guys. That's why, and I have, I have voiced this before, why having all these guys when you're not going to see them? Is he just signing them to... I think he signs a lot of them and he never really uses them maybe one time. Yeah. Do you think he and feels you never... sorry for them, some of these people? Because, I mean, they're not going to be just like picked up by WWE, a lot of these guys. Do you think Tony's just wants to help these wrestlers or? Well, I don't think he's that. I don't know. Giving. I don't... He's got a. Does he. Okay, let me. I don't know how he pays. Some of these guys, they're paid on appearance. By appearance, I don't know. I had always assumed when he <laughs> signed him to a contract, he was paying him a yearly fee, and then they did independent dates on top of that as well. So if he doesn't use them, he's paying him for nothing. Absolutely. And why, why are you paying him? Yeah, I, I don't think you need 143 talents to fill three hours of TV. It's a TV show. And, a, and one of them's an hour. The most you could use in that hour is, is, is 20 of them. The most you could use. And as matches go, they, they don't, they're not minute matches. I mean, they'll, they'll go 10, 12, 14 minutes, sometimes longer than that. Yeah, but you don't need 143 wrestlers, so I, that's a question I can't answer. And to me, if he's paying them just to sign them, hell, hey, sign me. <laughs> just sign. And I'll, I just want him to come around you. I'll just stay away. Just send me a check. Give me about two grand a week. And uh, I'll just sit here and talk about your show. Of course, I'll be like Meltzer. I'll talk about your show, but, but I'll, I'll make you look in glowing terms. So that's what I think Meltzer's, what his purpose is there anyway. Hey, for two grand a week, I'd do that as well. Um, let's get to the press conference itself. And all that happens, CM Punk wins back the AW title. Then we go to the post-match media scrum, as your new favourite word, scrum. Just before, <laughs> very quickly, how, how stupid is it to have an after-pay-per-view press conference where all you do for now is sit and talk about just all your fake matches and all the fake feuds that were going on in the previous four hours where you were trying to build interest? No kidding. I was thinking the same thing. I said, wait a minute. They just had a pay-per-view. They're going to go out there and kill each other. Now they're talking about something totally, especially with Punk. Punk was talking about something totally different anyway. But they talk about, well, we thought about doing this, and we thought about doing that, and blah, 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 blah. 
what the hell are they doing? It's like saying, okay, we just gave you this show. Now we're going to tell you that it's all fake and it's all the work. And we put it, uh, that's how much work we put into it. People, we think about how to tell this story. It's like game of Thrones. I mean, but you could see the writers coming on that. Well, we thought about doing this and that, you know, that, but with this, I don't see the purpose. I, whose idea was this anyway? Tony's. It must have been. It's like, you know, Walking Dead. And then they had like this companion show called Talking Dead, where they just sit around and talk about the yeah, show yeah, that yeah, just yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's the same kind of thing, except you might as well have all the actors just give away all the, I don't know. It, it's I don't so know worthless. either. How, do they do this every pay-per-view? It, well, I, I think maybe they do, yeah. I've never seen anything like it. Now, I've never been in a scrum. What do they call that in soccer when they all get in the ball? And- no, that's rugby. That's a that is a scrum. Oh, that is that's where it came from. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, I thought it had to be had to had to be British, but yeah, you, it's like having a show somewhere, and then telling the people later, "Hey, we're gonna be in this little room back here. So if you want to know more about it, <clears throat> come back here, and, and we'll have all the participants talking about it." Now, I'm looking at it like, I don't get it. I mean, like, we, we want you to believe this, but yet, on the other hand, we want you to know, and hell, what do I know? Hell, it might be great. Hell, it might even help their business. I don't know. But crazy. I will move on. I, I did want to bring this up because it was just quite ironic. Uh, I think someone emailed me and told me this was MJF uh, when the subject of MJF was brought up. CM Punk wasn't as harsh on him as other people. In my opinion, it started veering into a bit of a worked situation where he was trying to build interest for a match. But uh, he'd said that MJF, in regards to his, ish- his issues with Tony Khan, shits where he eats. And Punk mm. said this while he was eating a muffin <laughs> and... yeah. And metaphorically doing a big old shit right on Tony Khan's company in front of him. Amazing. And, and Tony's sitting right beside him going, yeah, yeah nodding. With, those, with those eyes wide open. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but, but who he was hard on was uh, he busted on the on page mm-hmm. and he busted on the Jacksons, right? We, yes. Um, before we get to the Jacksons, uh, I'd like to bring up Adam Hangman Page. Now, uh, one of the criticisms Punk brought up was that a couple of weeks ago, uh, Adam Page gave this quote to Galaxy.com. He says, I'm stubborn. I don't take advice. I listen to people say things, but very rarely do I listen hard. I was part of the movement that created the entire company, and I'm a world champion. I don't know. He wasn't world champion at the time. Uh, I don't know that I need their advice. I'll certainly listen, but there is something to be said about trial and error and doing it on our own. I take more pride in that. So he takes pride in not taking (coughs) advice. (coughs) Well, (coughs) excuse me a minute. Let's put Hangman Page in the, in the role of an NFL running back. The coach calls him over to the sidelines and says, I want you to do this. Oh, and he's thinking, oh, I'll, I'll listen to it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I want. So the next play, instead of taking the coach's advice, he does what he wants to do and gets dropped for a two-yard loss. You know what happens next? They yank him out of the game and cuss him out on the sidelines and tell him to sit down because this is a, this basically wrestling is a team sport. Unless we all work together for the same common good or the common end, which should benefit everybody, it doesn't work. And you got to also work for the fans. But working for the fan, just like we said, doesn't mean having a scrum at the end of the thing telling everybody that it was all a work from the beginning. They know that. They don't want to be slapped in the face with it. But if you get let me put it like this. If let's say Stan Hansen called the Bucks over and want to give them a little advice and they didn't want to listen. Well, the next time he got them in the ring, literally he would he would wear them out with clotheslines. You know, those little super kicks, slapping the legs. 
he let them, he let both of them kick him in. He wouldn't even, he wouldn't even register it. You know what a register is? A, a cell, a reaction. Actually, it's not even a cell. A register actually is just like blinking your eyes. That's the register. And when I said he, he wouldn't even register the kick, that's what he'd do. They'd kick him, he'd blink his eyes and double close on him. He would beat those four boys half to death, and they would be literally afraid to get back in the ring with Stan Hansen. Stan's a great guy. Of course, a lot of them are great guys till they don't like you. Abdullah is a great guy if he likes you. Undertaker is a great guy if he likes you. But if they don't like you, I mean, they don't take any, they don't take any like unnecessary precautions to protect you. I mean, they're not going to hurt you, but what they're going to do, they're not going to oversell you. They're just going to get their stuff in and then beat you on top of that. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the little bucks, they're little guys. They weigh maybe 200 pounds, maybe. If that. If that is what I'm saying. But a guy not taking advice from somebody like, like, like Paige or somebody, that's just showing inexperience and disrespect. I don't know why nobody has told him that. But I'm sure some of those agents backstage said, hey, man, you got to listen. You got to play the game. If a guy gives you advice, listen to it, but don't go out on some damn dirt sheet and say, I don't listen to advice. I don't care who gives it to me. And if I was the booker, if I was Tony Khan and I heard that and I give him advice, so well, well, is he going to follow it or is he just going to go and go in business for himself? Is he just going to do what he wants to do, which actually paints paints a, a bad picture for the entire team, for the entire locker room. And it makes now, now we're getting closer to the discontent in that dressing room. We've heard about, and everybody's trying to push it on CM Punk. I don't think Punk can be held completely responsible. He's not the most, you know, gung ho type guy. Let's go and do it as a team. He's not a team guy, but he does play by the established rules. And by Hangman Page, how long has Hangman Page even been in the business? Uh, I, just, I just had his Wikipedia up about 13, 14 years. Well, where's he been? Uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, he was a fairly big star there. Ring of Honor for about seven years. AEW since 2019. I never heard of him before he showed up on AEW. Never heard of him. Never even heard of him from somebody else talking about him. Never. Because I don't follow Japanese wrestling anyway because... I mean, a lot of guys can get to New Japan. Doesn't mean they're that good. Just somebody just, it's like anything else. If, if they just, I, they just like them, but he should listen. And even though he's been in the business 13 years, see, drawing money in Japan is not like drawing money in the United States. See, because Japan, you either do what they say or they, they won't bring you back. So he had to follow the game plan. In Japan, he had to listen to their advice. He had to listen to their instructions. Otherwise, he wouldn't be going back. But for him to get to AEW and then tell somebody, nah, he's stubborn. He don't listen to advice. That's really a cocky attitude to take. So, and I don't know the guy. I just heard about him. Maybe a great guy. But I wish he hadn't said that because that's going to follow him around. Yeah, that will leave a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths, I feel. Uh, we're going to go on to the executive vice presidents. Uh, I'll I'll ask you two questions in quick succession. Uh, the anti-life equation asks, does Dutch think making active and relatively inexperienced wrestlers EVPs, executive vice presidents, was a mistake? So we're talking about the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. Yep. And do you know, not block, uh, does Dutch have any other examples of active wrestlers being in positions of power like Kenny and the Young Bucks? And has it ever gone well? Okay, let's let's just take the term executive vice president. I don't even know what that means. 
it's, it's a term. Well, they're not bookers. They can suggest stuff no. to Tony, as anyone can, but they're not bookers. I, I, I don't know exactly what that means. I don't know if people defer to them like agents, but they've got agents, so I don't know. So, well, now we're talking blind. I've never heard of an executive vice president in the wrestling business. Never even heard of it. I think that when Tony started his company, he got, he got surrounded by Cody and the Bucks and Omega because he was a big fan of Japanese wrestling, correct? Yeah, I can buy that. And I think he wanted them to help him start this company. So I think he gave him executive vice president with a title because he could pay them this certain wage that that title suggested he pay them. But I don't know what they do. I, I really don't. Other than put out that little YouTube five minute video every week or two. You ever watch that? No, I've got far better things to do in my time. No kidding. I, I've tried to watch it, but it didn't make a damn bit of sense. It's like two 16 year old kids trying to, trying to do a video of they're not even good comedians. I mean, a lot of people aren't, but the show, I, it never interested me. So they do have a young fan base. So they were aiming it in the right direction, but I, I don't know what an executive vice president does. Is it a good idea to have these guys only in the business sense so when Punk was doing his press conference and he was talking about executive vice presidents, if I don't know and you don't know, I don't know who would know. And I bet you if you even ask them, they don't even know what their jobs are. So, and what was the rest of that question? Uh, has it ever gone well where active wrestlers are in the main event and they've got a say in booking direction? Oh, yeah. It's went, it's, it's went well a lot of times. But that's just when people respected the, uh, the chain of command. Dusty roads in Florida. Nothing but money. Because Dusty was in the main event and he was the booker and said, Hey, everybody's, but Dusty was, is a different animal. You know, at every Tuesday night in Tampa, they'd all go out drinking to a local bar and the heel stayed over here and <laughs> baby faces stayed over there. And the fans that went, they respected that because that was a, and it was easy to explain to a fan, why do you guys come to the same bar? And it's easy to explain. So now the guy's a big wrestling fan and we get our drinks, I have price, and this, and they just stay. And he says, and if you just want to cover it, you could say, well, the guy said, if we ever get in a fight in here, we're done. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to, that covers it. And you're okay. Let's, let's take another thing of, of a guy a book in the territory and it doing well. Lawler. Lawler did the same thing. Nothing but money. He'd, he'd work his stuff. And I do like the way Lawler did his booking. He'd do it in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. He just figured out, we'll do this, 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 this. And guess what he figured out for the finish sometimes? He'd do it on the spot. Because I've, I've been in Memphis with Lawler, and I'd go to Lawler up. Show started at 830. Jerry, what am I doing tonight? I'll get with you in just a minute. Hang on. Okay. Eight o'clock. Jerry, what am I doing? Wait a minute. I'll, I'll be right with you. That's eight o'clock. 8.15. Jerry, what's, what's the finish, man? Uh, and he's doing, he, he was doing something. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll just, just be paid. I'll get, I'll get with you. You know how many times I got to finish going through the door to the floor? Oh, a lot of times, some 10 times, sometimes we'd be walking toward the door from the dressing room to the door and he'd be giving it to me and tell me to give it to my opponent in the ring. Cause it wouldn't be a, you know, a real 
long drawn out deal. So I'm thinking, why couldn't you give me that like an hour ago? <laughs> Instead of me having to come and ask and ask. Yeah. And there have been situations where the booker, uh, booking a territory was a top guy. Oh, he was an executive vice president and, uh, and things went well, but not with these guys, because I think these guys have set a bad, bad example now, not only to the wrestling fans that follow AEW, but to their own people, to their own dressing room. They look like a bunch of just high school kids playing around. Mm -hmm. And once you lose that respect, and this is what I think Tony may have done. I think he's lost really the respect of the dress room. I hope he hasn't. And he may have a way to bring it back. I hope he does. But I, I think if he can bring a dress room back, he can bring this one back. But I don't think he's going to bring it back without threatening something. And by him just suspending guys, that's not enough. He's got to fire a few now, for, the, for the message to get through. Now, with the fight itself, I'll uh, I'll do the short version of this. Uh, what I th what people most people think has happened now, if uh, we've put all the facts together, supposedly, is um, most people believe Young Bucks and Kenny Omega storm into Punk's locker room. It was thought that the kicking down the door thing never actually happened. Uh, to try and get at Punk, Punk throws the first punch, probably in self-defense, hits Mac Jack Jackson at least once, possibly multiple times. A Steel, who was looking after Punk's dog, Larry, or, and was also Punk's trainer originally, and he's uh, currently an AEW producer, ended up throwing a chair that hits Nick Jackson, and he's an agent. He shouldn't be. He should be de-escalating this fight, not escalating it. Yes. And then when Kenny Omega tries to pull a steal off Nick Jackson, he bites Kenny Omega and pulls his hair. Uh, now this was all seen by AEW's head of legal, Mega Parekh, if I'm uh, pronouncing that right. Yeah. Uh, independent third party has been charged with investigating the incident. Now, we've got a load of EVP questions. And how would Dutch have dealt with the situation had he been running the company? Suspensions, firings, let the boys hash it out and move on forwards. Uh, would love to know how you would have addressed the fight aftermath. Well, Tony worked himself into a shoot here. That's what they did. He let that locker room descent fester and fester and fester. Then it finally come up into this big blister. And all it needed was a little prick and it's going to go everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And as far as your executive vice president storming into a room, beating a door down, that's not possible. Those doors are storm doors. You can't beat them down. They may kick the hell out of it. And Slap, it the sounds, leg. Slap the leg while yeah. they kick the door through. Oh, yeah. They, they was probably doing that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got it. I got it, brother. <laughs> Don't worry about it. But when they came in, and I'm sure they would come in, they weren't quiet like, we need to talk to you. They probably came in ready to fight. And then, as they say, he punched one of them first. And like you said, in self-defense, I'm sure that happened. And I think Ace Steele's wife was in the room too. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why he threw a chair. Like you said, he should have been de-escalating it. Or if one of the Bucks had started the fight with, the other Buck should have been trying to get in there between our Omega. And Omega did try to get in there, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and he got bit. If this would happen in a regular company, they'd all been fired. They would have all been fired. They have to be fired. Unless now you, you're sending the message that, well, you know, but now wrestling is different than a regular company. You need these people. They have more TV time than anybody else. And all of a sudden you're going to fire them for them not being able to control themselves. I would go farther than fire them. I mean, uh, if I'm, if, if I'm going to not say fire them, but if I'm going to suspend them, I'm going to suspend them and find them about 20 grand because wrestlers respond to money. That's the only thing they respond to or where well, they can respond to a lot of other stuff too, but you got to make it biting. 
and tell them that this first case is a test case. Anybody else will be fired on the spot. And they fired some people that were just in the room. Uh, Chris, what's his name? Uh, Christopher Daniels. Why'd they fire him? Well, they didn't fire him. No one's been fired yet. Everybody's been suspended. I've got a list of about four of the people who they suspended, okay. if you give me a minute. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, God, right. Okay, I've got to search <laughs> for it now. Uh, I can't I can't get the two pages. There we go. Um, here we go. Uh, Pat Buck, uh, Michael Nakazawa, Brandon Cutler, and Christopher Daniels were also suspended. So I think they were just suspended because they happened to be in the room and probably breaking up the fight and... Legally, everyone's suspended until the investigation is complete. Okay, now you talk legally. This is something that I'm expecting. Whoever doesn't like the outcome of this, they're going to file suit. And that legal, that legal guy in the room, he can't even handle it because he's a witness. Just say it was a lady. It was a lady? Yes. Yeah. I didn't, well, it's an Indian name, right? Yeah. What's her name? Uh, I think Mega. Mega Parek. <laughs> okay, Mega. <laughs> what a name. Mm. Oh, I love you, Mega. <laughs> <laughs> but then, to me, I think there could be some legal uh, repercussions from this. And who's going to sue who? I don't know. But I think they're going to sue each other. They could sue the company. They, they could sue Tony. Uh, uh, unsafe workplace. Now, you're talking about workers' rights. Now your workers' rights can come in. Mm -hmm. Because OSHA, I don't think they work under that. But, but they protect workers' rights in, in all those big factories and everything. But if it's an unsafe workplace... And now that's taking a uh, that's taking a a work to a shoot to a bigger shoot. Now we're working our way toward that question. Remember, you're going to save it at the end. Oh, I've got a couple. I've got a couple more first. Um, okay. Here we go. Right. So um, EVP's criticism. Now a couple of these will be pretty short answers. Oh, for God's sake! I've got the wrong page now. Goodness me, this is professionalism. Let me tell you. Okay. Um, Baptist <laughs> Tampa Bay. How many? Uh, sorry. How? Have different territorial promoters have handled similar situations, particularly how have you personally seen Eddie, Eddie Graham, Jerry Jarrett, Bill Watts, or the Fullers handle specific locker room conflicts, insubordination, going into business for yourself, etc.? Well, I've, I've seen insubordination handled very simply. They just got fired. They told him to go home, don't come back. This way, Bill Watts would, would settle it. It was junkyard, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Butch, Butch Reed. Reed, Butch Reed, and the Berserker. They got into a big tiff, and but word got back to Watts that they were mad at each other and they wanted. He called them together one Sunday afternoon. I think it was in. Uh, Oklahoma City, I think, because we used to do two shows on Sunday there. Oklahoma City was the afternoon show. And then the night show would be Tulsa. He called them together in Oklahoma City, and they were trying to talk it out. And he said, okay, guys, best thing we do is fight it out. Just, yeah, have it out. And it was, it was just Watts and Butch Reed and the Berserker in a room. And he said, let's see who wins. And they started fighting. And it lasted about three minutes. And I think one of them had a, a, a bloody eye, and the other one had like a nose. But, and then guess what? Now the guys got it out of them. Now they're mad. They've had some physical energy expended between the two of them. They shook hands. And they walked away and never had any more trouble. But he made them promise no more trouble. And they said, okay, no more trouble, no more trouble. They got it out. Because now they both realize that they might not be to whoop the other guy's ass as, as easily as they thought they could. And Butch Reed was a tough guy. So was Berserker. 
Berserker played pro football. He was a, he was a tough guy and, but they got it out. That's one way that that stuff is ended. Mm -hmm. Now, who else did you, Eddie Graham? Yep. Eddie Graham probably do the same thing, but Eddie had a way of talking to you. I don't know if you ever, you ever see Eddie look at you, he'd have that one eye down. And when he got serious, Eddie was, you could feel the intensity coming off Eddie. And I got a lot of respect for him. He always treated me. Well, he never got mad at me. I made sure that I didn't, I didn't want that tough son bitch damn mad at me, but guys respected him and they would do what he would say. Ron Fuller. I don't think ever had any, any troubles. I don't think who was yelling Jerry Jarrett. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think, I think Jerry would just end up if, if that had happened to Jerry Jarrett, uh, they'd have been fired. They they had be fired. Um, this is probably just a, a slight offshoot of that question. Jeff Wolfgang asks, how did you treat top guys with volatile personalities like Abby or Bruiser Brody compared to other wrestlers? So how do you uh, treat somebody with a volatile personality to calm them down? Very gently. Don't ever, <laughs> don't ever put you in a situation where they can get pissed at you. <laughs> so, but... I was never in charge of Bruiser or giving him any finishes, but I knew the story with him when I had him in Puerto Rico. You just didn't beat him because people expected him to stomp and romp and bleed a little bit and walk around the, the arena and going, orf, orf, and people would run from him. That was his match. And Abdullah, the same thing. So... We, uh, we shall move on then. Uh, Tony Khan, and then we'll let, get to Let me the... tell you this. Oh, go on. Abdullah, I just had taken the book over in Puerto Rico, my first night there. And here come Abdullah up to me, or, well, he didn't come to me. I went up to him because he's always sitting back like this. He sits there like a big Buddha, you know, sits <laughs> there. And he says, and if you hear his voice, his voice does not match his body. You know, Abdullah, you think would have, you know, a really rough voice, but you look at him and he, he speaks like this. Hey, champ. Hey, comes up by champ. Hey, champ. Hey, champ. So he called me when they said, Hey, champ. Uh, what's man Carlos doing? And I swear, I looked at him like he had two heads. I said, well, I guess like you've done 3000 other times, I guess go out there and beat the shit up each other bleed a little bit and we'll throw it out. That's what we do. You've done it a thousand times. So why should this one be any different? <laughs> and he said, okay. And they went out there and they did that. I told Carlos one day, this is off topic. Mm -hmm. I had him in the corner and I'm hitting him. You ever look at Carlos's head? Mm. Oh my God. I looked down at him and I said, you know, this looks like when I four connects with I 75 <laughs> <laughs> right outside Tampa. That's what it looks like. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it, it was, it, it was horrible. Sometimes Carlos, he, he, he cut so much. You didn't even have to touch him sometimes. Just tap him right here. It's gone. Oh, it looked terrible. So, but anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I, as you know, interviewed Bushwhacker Luke uh, not too long ago. And I said, God, your forehead's pristine. And then he lent in because, you know, there's a there's a quality issue when you're doing these Zoom calls. It's not as sharp. And yeah. then he lent in. He went, oh, my God, it's the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Yeah. Several of them all crisscrossing. Amazing. Well, I, I'd been in the business about, I don't know, a year and I went from Atlanta to like the Tennessee territory. And they wanted me, they call it getting juice, which I've never been a fan of at all. I didn't even know how to make it up. Somebody had to show me how to make it. So I went out there and it's my first time ever doing it. I'm actually scared to death. 
I'm scared of, I'm, I'm scared of going both ways. I'm scared of not getting enough. Then I'm scared of getting too much. Then I'm scared on the third level of just doing it, just taking something sharp and sticking it into your head. That, that takes a, a little bit of insanity, I think. So I did it, but I did it too much. Oh, I scared the hell out of myself. I'm, I'm just bleeding like buckets. And I'm thinking, damn, what the hell am I got myself into? I actually started to quit the business that day. <laughs> so, but then you make a mistake. You show them that you can get a good a bit of color, they call it. Now they want it all the time. So from then on, when they told me to do it, well, it'd be like this. I was holding my hand back. <laughs> and then I'd stick myself. Oh, <laughs> I was, a, I was a real wussy when it come to that. So after about the fourth or fifth time, I didn't, I got like a, I've got more, I've got more blood shaving than I got off doing that. So when they saw that I wasn't getting any, they stopped asking me. <laughs> now, if it was a, if it was a, a, a later on, if it was a big money match or something, yeah, I could have forced myself to do it, but I was, I've never been a fan of that at all. Mm. Some guys based their whole career off that. Brody based it, uh, other than beating the crap out of people. Abdullah based his on that, instead of beating the crap out of people. Hanson and those guys like that. They And why they got over in Japan? You know why they got over in Japan so good? Well, they wanted them to get over, but they have – in Japan, they're called uh, – I forgot what they call her now. Or well, the foreigners, Gaijin. No, it, they have an English name. They just call like not jobbers, but I forgot. But that's their young boys. They go in there, young boys. They call them that. Yep, and they had another name. I can't remember now. But all they would do, Abdullah and, and Brody and Hanson, they just beat them up, beat them up physically. I mean, not in the face, in the head, but around the body. And what, I mean, they'd lay their stuff in, but the young boys would take it because they gained respect. They gained respect, not only with the, with the office people or the booker, but the other guys too, they withstood the onslaught and they got a respect and those guys. And they never intended to hurt them. They would just like, I mean, Stan was just rough anyway. You know, when he hit you that clothesline, he literally hit you with the clothesline. You felt it. And Abdullah, when he dropped that 400-pound elbow on you, he don't drop an elbow. He drops a body. <laughs> so he dropped it on me one time, and I was moving because I knew what he was going to do. So he was going to – he didn't – like I said, he didn't drop the elbow – he dropped half his back on top of you too. <laughs> oh, oh, he would kill you. But that's why those guys got over and they did not sell for anybody till they got up with Baba and the, the, the top names. And they that's did not they slap the thigh. Oh no. They didn't do kicks anyway. If they kicked, they just they'd kick you for real. <laughs> you know, Brody threw that extended kick and he looked good, but he didn't he didn't slap a thigh, he doesn't hit you. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. What if you put the young bucks in? with Brody and Hanson, they would uh, literally, they, they'd had those two guys crying because, and I'm not saying, I don't know, the Jackson boys may have a lot of guts. They don't have that much guts. They couldn't withstand a 10 minute match or even a five minute match. If Hanson and Brody wanted to lay on them, no way. Yeah, there's guts so, and then there's complete stupidity, I think. But yeah, <laughs> or you got to EVP. You can pull it out. The executive vice president, don't touch me. Don't touch me. But <laughs> um, Speaking of which, right, I'm going to ask you a few more questions, and I will thank you for your time for our CM Punk special. And uh, just to mention, CM Punk was stripped of the AWA world title, which he was going to be anyway because he sustained some sort of arm injury, probably a tricep tear, which will keep him out of action for around eight months. Uh, Young Butts and Kenny Omega were also stripped of the trios titles. Who cares? Um, additional thoughts. A couple more questions from fans. Um and I'll ask two in a row because it'll be uh, amongst the same question uh, answer. Gator asked, 
asks, can this be turned into a money-making angle, just like Brett Shaw, Matt Hardy, Edge, etc.? What would Dutch do if he was the booker? And Sir Griefalot asks if they don't turn, or says uh, if they don't turn this into a company-wide civil war where everybody's forced to pick a side, they're going to miss one of the biggest opportunities in professional wrestling. How would you book your I way think, out of this one? Well, I think they've already missed it. I think that, you know, I have never watched Dynamite in my life. Till I heard about all this stuff, I said, I'm going to tune in and see what's going on. But I missed it because I tuned in late. I said, well, surely they won't be, they'll do an in-ring and they'll talk about it. But they didn't even do that. They did Tony Khan up front doing a sit down, which made it look less, uh, you know, uh, not effective, but less serious than what it was. So when he suspended this guy and those guys, well, you can't suspend people and do angles with them at the same time. Didn't even say their names. They And they treated it like it wasn't a big deal. I mean, this was the, one of the biggest publicity opportunities for AEW that they've ever had. And it was unplanned. Either Tony didn't have time to think about it or just wanted to get past it as fast as he could. Well, he got past it. So I don't know how you bring it back. And especially with, with uh, CM Punk out. And uh, I mean, he's out with an injury. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do anything with him. How many times has he been hurt in the last two months, three months? Uh, he's it's had the third time? three matches, and he's been hurt twice really badly, I think. And did he get hurt in the fight? Uh, no, uh, we believe he got hurt in the match. He got hurt in the so match he, uh, quite so early on as well get, on a tope. So he didn't get hurt in a real fight, but got hurt in a perceived fight yeah it See? speaks it speaks a lot to how not tough the young bucks are because cm punk was the absolute dirt worst ufc fighter in the modern era in history and he could still take with one arm matt jackson who's who's three on one i i don't i i don't i don't know what they're going to do with it but no how would i book it i'd have to really stop and think about it but see, if he's going to be gone eight months, you can't start talking about him now because by the time you get the time he gets back, hell, it's old hat now. Mm -hmm. I just say, I think he's going to have to do more than that. I mean, to even make it look like it's more serious, as serious as it was. I don't think people are really taking in all the all the ramifications of this. Now, who I think's in a tough spot is that legal analyst that was in the dressing room. Uh -huh. I think she's, it's a she, right? You said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mega, hey, Mega, <laughs> you're, in a, you're in a tough spot, honey. I don't know what to tell you. But, and I don't even know what Tony Khan is thinking. Who knows? All right, go to the next question. Well, i got to get done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll give you one or two more, then I'll leave you to it. Uh, you said in the previous podcast, uh, I don't think Tony Khan can lose on this one. <laughs> Well, that's what I thought at, at the time because it was so well laid out. Or he, and it could have been laid out just by accident. But I did say, well, he closed one gap or one hole or one door and he opened up about four more. Those other four doors have since closed too. They've been slammed shut, I guess, from the bucks kicking them open, I guess. But. Yeah, I did say that. I say a lot of things sometimes I shouldn't say, but how could you miss with what they had laid out? But apparently you can, because when you let talent all of a sudden set their own rules and we're going to... Uh, the only way I can describe this is backstage uh, impact, because I think the, the Bucks want to be looked at as the bosses and Omega, but now punks, he's opened that door. Now that you're a piece of crap and you don't know what you're doing. Now that's what they're pissed at. 
-hmm. because they're pissed at losing their, their clout in the dressing room, but they have to, I I think there's other ways to, to go about getting his attention other than, other than trying to punch him. And you say what you want to about CM Punk's, uh, MMA career. He still had to train for that, so he had to learn to protect himself somehow. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. He, like, he trained at Duke, Duke Rufus, which is a very highly touted gym for a good couple of years, so he learned something, definitely. He had to. So here, Matt Jackson coming in, hey, you SOB, blah, 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 blah. And then he, and I'm sure CM Punk did throw the first punch because if you somebody's coming at you in an aggressive manner, and Punk's probably got a hot temper too. He just let it fly. And for the very last question, uh, sort of a two-part question, who do you fire? Who do you just keep suspended and find? And also, who is most in the wrong and who's most in the right? So CM Punk, Tony Khan, EVPs, a steal. Well, I think the blame has to go to the top guy. It's got to go to Tony for not knowing his own locker room. Of course, he may have known. He may, he may have hired too many people. Now, who knows? It's hard to keep track of 143 people. And he's, uh, if you put on top of that agents and producers, and he's got 200 people working for him. Easy. So how can, I, I don't know what his TV contracts are, but he can't be making that much money on them. Because he's too busy paying people, but I hold the uh, I hold Punk responsible for going out there on that scrum. My that's my favorite new word now, <laughs> the scrum, and just blasting everybody, blasting even Colt Cabana, who some people don't even know, and that's from even another company that's coming back, blasting him, then blasted. Uh, Hangman Page, and then MVP, blasted the Young Bucks. Brian Alvarez. Yeah, he, what, did he blast him too? Yep. What do you say about him? Oh, just said he was mad at him for propagating the rumor that he got Colt Cabana moved to Ring of Honor. Okay. And that's what they do. Because I, I don't know how to break this to people, but we're in this clickbait era. So the more negative you are, the more clickbait you're going to get. I said a deal one time about Sting that got a lot of attention. And what I said about Sting, if you ask him today how he got over in WCW, he couldn't tell you because it wasn't his idea. It was Scott Hall's idea, really. And he could go and do what you ask him to do or what the role required for that night. But he couldn't, he couldn't tell you, he couldn't lay out right now how he got over. But I don't, I, this is, this is something I've never seen before in a wrestling business. It won't go away uh, overnight. I mean, it has died down quite a bit already, but I don't think the suspensions and, had much to do with it, but, but I don't, I still don't think we've heard the worst of this yet. And, uh, just to, uh, just to get it from you before we shut down, who do you, who do you fire? Do you fire anybody? Do you fire Ace Steel because he didn't help matters? Do you fire CM Punk because no one likes him? Do you fire the EVPs? Tough question. That's for, that's for Tony Khan. What I would do, I would fire him for about, you know, if you're fired without repercussions, I mean, if you're suspended and get a check, that's like almost being rewarded. Mm. Now, I think he needs to take the bucks and suspend them without pay for about six months. Pump, same thing, because he would respect money. Uh, he's already out anyway, so. Yeah, it's, just don't pay him if you can. I don't know what his contract says. <clears throat> the other guys, now I'm saying, if you're just in the dressing room, I don't know why uh, an A-Steel, 
you could just fire him. I think he's just an agent anyway. I don't even know the guy. No. I may have met him. I've never heard anything bad about him, though. But Christopher Daniels, if he was just in the room, I don't know why he would be suspended or anybody else that was just in the room. Now, this fight supposedly, wait a minute, allegedly <laughs> went on for five or six minutes, they said. But I don't think the fight went on for five or six minutes. I think the fight went on maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds. And then the after fight cussing went, went on for five minutes because they were cussing each other. And that's what I think happened. But I think that maybe uh, Christopher Daniels probably got heat from probably not def defusing the situation or getting the bucks out or getting Omega out or because you can't run punk out of his own dressing room. They were in his dressing room. So it's going to be a tough decision for, for Mr. Tony Khan to handle. I think we need to put a wrestler's court on this. <laughs> That's where a wrestler's court really and needs to come. You can be the judge. You're, a third, you're be, an impartial I, intermediary. I would. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd call it right down the middle. And that would be an interesting, that would be an interesting court case. Mm. What if really, if you had Judge Judy and this went in front of her, if I was Tony Khan, I would try to get that done. <laughs> Think of the viewing audience you would have for that. Mm. It would really help Judge Judy, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'll, and, I'd like you to be the prosecuting attorney or the defense, either one. Oh, I won't be prosecutor. I, I want. I want to just blame people for their actions. <laughs> so, but it's all up to Judge Judy anyway, right? Yeah, absolutely. Who do you think would get convicted? Um, man, I think it'd be a push. They'd all be convicted. Of, they'd all be guilty of something, wouldn't they? Yeah, I think it'd be a push. It'd even out. But yeah, they've all convicted. One of striking well, the other. The one Jacksons would be another. One would be attempted assault, and the other would be assault. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could blame Trump for. I mean, Trump, uh, <laughs> punk, punk, for saying uh, he was defending himself. I don't think that. But and I'm going to watch. Now, this is a Thursday. This is a special. Mm -hmm. I'm going to watch tomorrow night Rampage, and uh, I do it on Sports Kita Facebook. Comes on at eleven o'clock Eastern Time, right after Rampage. We watch SmackDown and we watch Rampage, which I'll have to say, did you see SmackDown? I mean, uh, Clash at the Castle. Do you know I actually did watch a couple of matches, and I never watched WWE. I watched the Walter and um, Sheamus thing, and it was like, oh, it's nice actually seeing two people hit each other in yeah. safe places, but a real stiff, hard hitting. They match. beat the crap out of each other. The crowd appreciated it. Mm -hmm. They gave them a standing ovation, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. And which, which I respect. And I don't know how many people remember this, but they used to be. Two wrestlers named Johnny Valentine and Wahoo McDaniel. They started this angle in mid uh, mid Atlantic, which was the Charlotte territory, and these guys beat the shit out of each other for extended periods. Valentine was famous for having forty five. 50 minute matches. Can you imagine taking that punishment like Gunther and Seamus took for 50 minutes? But they took it seven night, eight nights a week because they'd have a double header on Sunday. And that just to show you how tough some of these guys were. Because Valentine didn't expend any energy he didn't need to expend. And he had a famous saying. He said, the people might think that wrestling's fake, but they won't think I'm fake. And him and Wahoo, I mean, they would leave with blood blisters on their chest. And I'm thinking, damn, 
they were more dedicated to their craft than I would be. Cause oh, I got a few of those. I'd have to call in sick or something. <laughs> I said, hell I, and some people have even quit the business and refused to work with Valentine because of that. One was Les Thatcher and he's still, he's still, he's still on uh, social media, mm. but he'll tell you right quick. No, don't, don't touch me. Cause he was, he wanted the finesse of the business. Not uh, just beating the crap out of me. Not the not not the really tough stuff. And I don't blame him. Valentine, big guy, six four, six five, about two sixty, and and he had a crazed look to him. When you look at him, he'd look at you. Like, <laughs> if you saw him in a alley with just his face exposed, you'd run the other way. And uh, but, and, and uh, Walter and Shame is probably your favorite match for a good long while, then. Oh yeah, I mean. When I first saw Gunther, I said, there's something to this kid. Mm. And I'm, this is a, one of the things that I think benefited him was Vince resigning because I think Vince would have maybe put him in such a position that he couldn't stay over. I don't think Vince did it on purpose, but I think he just did it because he didn't, he didn't know any better, but now that Triple H is in charge, I think we'll see a hell of a push for Gunther. Uh, I think you'll see a renewed push for Sheamus because he 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 remade himself. Mm, old workout buddies that, as well. Are they really? Oh, they were, yes. Well, uh, but and I think Karrion Cross, they're pushing him like a son of a bitch. I've never seen him work, have you? No. So I don't know that much about him but they're painting him like a killer. So now it would be perfect. And I think Roman Reigns, I think he's going to, when he loses that belt, he's going to get hurt and he's going to stay out about six months. That's what I think. Yeah. Give the other guys a chance to shine. Give, you know, give the other guys the heels time to get established and then he'll come back in. He'll be a baby face. Him and Cody probably at that time. Mm. So, but you can see it coming, but that's a good thing to see. Yeah. I want to, I want to see that, but I don't think you're going to see a scrum right after a WWE pay-per-view. I don't think you're going to see that. It's a shame. Next time there's a scrum, I'm going to, I'm actually going to fly over and I'm going to turn up to it and hopefully get some footage and some views out of it as well. Pay for my flight. Listen, thank you so much Dutch for doing (laughs) this thing. Uh, I know this was a bit of a last minute thing. You know, it's a special. We always said we do a special here or there for a special Well, we've we've been kind of, we've been kind of lucky because the other two specials, we did was on Vince resigning mm-hmm. and then Brock Lesnar left and then turned back up two hours later. Right. So, but we don't do it for nothing. Mm-hmm. We do it because something is pressing and we need to get it out before time runs out. So uh, time runs out on us. So, but anyway, good show today. Uh, and I will go, I think you're the best interviewer in the entire wrestling business. And you know why? Uh, a lot up. of things is well that's one thing <clears throat> but you can hear the guests <clears throat> and you don't really watch the shows like I don't so we both might be we might be better off just not watching it anyway <laughs> but I don't watch but I do think you reach a point where you can you can't watch everything mm. because then you get uh I think you get probably tainted on what you're watching but anyway When are we coming back? Uh, We're coming back. Well, we're going to be recording on Wednesday. Uh, The next podcast will be out tomorrow as we record this. I'm going to be in Turkey next Wednesday. So when we record, I'll be on Turkey. More Turkey, Mr. Chandler. I'm going to be in Antalya, Turkey in some resort, uh, sunning myself and, um, you know, just drinking until I pass out. How how is, I've never been there. How is Turkey? Fucking hot. (laughs) Is it really? (laughs) Yeah, even, even now. I don't know in Fahrenheit, but it's... 30 something in celsius so i think that means oh that's hot it's like 85 90 maybe it's gotta be more than that in fahrenheit yeah it's gotta be in the 90s yeah and we've had a we've had a heat wave over here man so i was looking forward to a bit of cold and then the missus rings uh, says i've got two weeks off we're going right here i was like all right good 
Yeah. Okay. So I've bought a laptop. Uh, I've bought a laptop just for this show that we're going to record hopefully next week, and the internet will hopefully be good, and I'll get it out the usual time. All right. Hey, fans, if you got any questions, Dirty Dutch Van Tail with two L's at uh, gmail.com. Mm-hmm. And I usually get back to people unless it's just a stupid email. And I've gotten a couple of those too. Mm-hmm. One guy said, how can you help me with wrestling? And that was it. I went, I don't know. What do you want me to do? But I, I, I never responded back mm-hmm. to him. But how do you answer a question like that? Well, I a- should say buy a ticket and just sit down and shut up. <laughs> And uh, I get a lot of emails as well. I get some weird, weird questions. But if you want me to pose a question to Dutch, email to questionsfordutch at gmail.com. But for now, thank you very much, Dutch, for joining uh, me and everybody else. And we'll catch you next time. And thank you for entertaining us. Thank you. We the people. <laughs>